I grew up during the civil rights and women's liberation movements in the United States. I was a fierce advocate of both. But the goal of these earlier campaigns was to break down the artificial barriers between us and to release us all into seeing each other not as black or white or male or female, but as individual people. Granted, with race and sex, we've still got a ways to go. But one of the greatest impediments to fully breaking free of our pigeonholes is the rise of identity politics. For we all fall into categories that weren't of our choosing. I was born white, female, and American. No one asked me beforehand whether I wanted to tick those boxes, and they are boxes. So I've never wanted these categories to define me, as I wouldn't want the categories into which the folks in this audience were unwillingly born to define you either. The color of my skin is an arbitrary accident, not a personal brand. As a woman, I often break the mold. I'm outspoken and sometimes unpleasantly aggressive. I dress badly. I even make a pretty lousy American, having spent most of my adult life in the UK. For me, the boxes into which I was born have been confinements I've struggled to get out of, and I would wish that liberation for everyone else. Identity politics urges us all instead to cling to the bars of our cages. In locating advantage and disadvantage, too, the movement pushes historically marginalized groups to deploy weakness as a weapon. Thus, you're strongly motivated to maintain that weakness, the better to push other people around with the unfairness of your terrible plight. Perversely, then, victims of racism, sexism, or homophobia, say, logically grow attack attached to the very prejudice from which they suffer, because prejudice translates into power. And without victimhood, they have no idea who they are. Ironically, the last thing the identity politics crowd wants to see is a truly equitable society. Absent bigotry, its activists would be lost. Identity politics doesn't eliminate human hierarchy, but simply flips the totem pole upside down. Thus, at the very bottom sit awful, undeservingly advantaged white people, and at the very, very bottom, white straight males, who, according to this creed, have no rights and no business venturing an opinion about anything, who are obliged to check their privilege, a.k.a. shut the fuck up. <laughs> well, I reject out of hand that any group should be told they have no rights and they have to put a sock in it. I happen to be married to a white, straight male, and I'm often very interested in what he has to say. <laughs> According to identity politics, the sins of the father are visited, visited upon the sons. If you're white, you accept responsibility for slavery, colonialism, and the slaughter of native peoples from Australia to America. But do we really believe in infinitely inherited guilt? Let's all be historically clear-eyed. But Germans coming of age today oughtn't to feel personally responsible for Dachau. Nor should any of us pretend to feel guilty about something we know perfectly well we didn't do. Have you noticed how many headlines these days involve race? How, as sociologists document a steady decline in racial prejudice, Relations between races seem to be getting worse. That's because this movement is inherently adversarial. It thrives on enemies. Though ostensibly concerned with victimhood, its proponents gleefully seek victims of their own. Identitarians have created a cutthroat, predatory environment in which often anonymous, self-appointed culture police prowl the halls of the internet searching for perceived violations of their orthodoxies. Using the wrong word, reaching for the wrong pronoun, allowing that amidst all the plunder and domination, maybe countries colonized by Britain enjoyed one or two teeny tiny benefits can now get you sacked. For this movement has issued in not the color and gender blindness we aspired to in my youth, but a hyper-awareness 
of race, gender, and ethnicity. Implicitly, the ideology pits disadvantaged groups against one another in a competition over who's been treated more badly. Rather than calling us to a shared community, it fosters a climate of anxiety, division, antagonism, touchiness, and paranoia. So in our universities, faculties are terrified to teach or publish anything that might conceivably step on a minority's toes. Self-censorship is rife, persecution common. In workplaces, employees negotiate a minefield of microaggressions and are afraid to make jokes. In my occupation, fiction is vetted by sensitivity readers, while many of my fellow writers are frightened of crafting characters different from themselves, lest they break a host of proliferating unwritten rules. In social settings, many of us have, if anything, grown less likely to approach a stranger of a different race, and not because we're bigots, but because we're fearful that we might inadvertently say the wrong thing. I don't call that progress. Inexorably, too, identity politics has conjured the boogeyman of white identity politics, now on the rise in the US. If we're all to understand each other in terms of our helpless membership of groups, white people are going to understand themselves in those terms as well. And it's interesting how unattractive it is to brandish your skin color as the most important aspect of your sense of self when white people start doing it too. Certainly, many of the folks staging this festival of taking offense are well-intended. We should all be alert to the fact that others may have experienced social and professional travails that we haven't. Yet surely the power dynamics of human hierarchies can't explain everything. Looking out the window and seeing only degrees of victimhood is a flat, oppressive, reductive, and depressing way of looking at the world. Sometimes it's a relief to think about something else. Architecture, color and light, outer space. So I, for one, do not plan on embracing my skin color or my gender or sexual preference as the sine qua non of my character. For I reject outright the very concept of identity that this poisonous, overtly racist, and sexist outlook promotes. I like dancing to talking heads. I'm a big fan of Graham Greene, Richard Yates, and Edith Wharton. I've published 13 books of my own, and whatever their failings, those novels are a part of who I am. I love the word mellifluous. I overuse the word insidious. I have a weakness for Poldark. I'm a mediocre tennis player who makes up for her deficits on the court with sheer ebullience. That and more is my identity. So if anyone aims to put Lionel Shriver, straight white female, on my tombstone, I'm definitely getting cremated.